right. Well, thank you so much again for letting me have a little time to talk about structure-based drug design, and in particular, structure-based drug design with Schrodinger software. So I uh, was asked to just kind of start at the start. So hopefully, if you are a little bit more familiar with structure-based drug design techniques, you can kick back and pick up a few things here and there. But to give everybody a common language and frame of reference, we're just going to begin with the obvious, which is that designing drugs is a difficult task. And this is often difficult because we need to have many different things correct in, at once. So one molecule needs to satisfy myriad different properties. And often, the situation that scientists are presented with is you have a molecule, such as you know, molecule one, that ticks most of the boxes except for one. And in trying to optimize that property that's out of the range in a new design, molecule two, we might accidentally knock a few different properties out of whack. And sometimes these properties have relationships that more or less may be intuitive, but oftentimes they do not. And so you end up with this iterative process where, again, you're trying to design through different types of properties, different types of um, things that you need to have all checked off in one molecule. And this takes a lot of money. So we often hear about how the clinical phase portion of drug discovery is quite expensive, and that is true. But for uh, in terms of an annualized expense, the lead optimization process is typically the most expensive. And for the eagle-eyed out there, you may notice that this reference is a little bit old, and some people will now put that figure at closer to $2.5 billion to get from the bench to bedside. So this is difficult. It takes a lot of money. It also takes a lot of time. And sometimes that's for a very good reason. So we want to make sure that what we are giving into the hands of people who need it is safe and will do what we claim it will do. However, you can see that somewhere around the 2000 mark, we've dipped below creating one drug per US billion dollars. So we're losing bang for our buck fairly steadily over time. And what we're hoping to do with computers, now that computers have reached a processing power to uh, allow these calculations that formerly took days, weeks, months to, to be done, now can be done you know, in days, hours, or minutes, or seconds. Now these calculations can be more useful in real time for drug development experiments. So we're hoping with the integration of computer-aided drug design, we can start to see a reversal in this trend. So let's begin by talking about how computers can, can assist with that. And I'm going to throw out the little caveat that I come from the small molecule drug discovery side of things. However, if biologics or protein structure prediction or refinement is more what you're interested in, these tools are also available for you as well. There, there are a lot more that I won't be able to discuss today. Also, materials design is part of the software package as well. So I will be focusing on small molecules. But biologics and materials design is certainly also part of this process. So let's start by seeing how big we can go. Probably the first way that computer-aided drug design is hoping to reverse that falling trend is by allowing scientists to explore a much larger swath of possibility than they could manually. And so if I were to ask you if you could create all possible combinations of drug-like molecules, how many could you create? The answer is a little bit up for debate, but most people would fall somewhere around the order of about 1 to the 60, or sorry, 10 to the 60 compounds, 10 to the 63, some, you know, in, in that range. So that is obviously a number that is completely mind-blowingly large. And we couldn't possibly hope to create and test all these molecules manually in the lab. So there are people who say there isn't enough carbon in the entire universe to create one amount of these 10 to the approximately 60 drug-like molecules. So this principal component analysis plot on the left is about 19 million of that 10 to the 63 possible drug-like compounds. And it is colored by the fraction of atoms in a ring. So the main thing to know is that little points on this principal component analysis plot represent molecules. And the further away those points are, the more chemically distinct we would consider those molecules. So what you can imagine is say that you are looking at compounds over here in this dark blue area. 
but really the compound you need for your particular research focus is over here in this orange area. Mathematically, it would be extremely difficult or take a very long amount of time to try and walk yourself from blue to orange. And in terms of your chances of trying to randomly sample across here and hopefully land in the right area, that's also quite small. And so what we'll be talking about today are ways that computers can help you grab a much larger section of chemical space and use different tools to triage yourself into the area that you need to be. So again, we're going to start very big, cast a very wide net, try and grab as much of that chemical space as we can, and use different techniques that balance computational speed with scientific accuracy to again try and triage and hone yourself into the area that you need to be. More recently, there was a paper out of the Choiquet lab that posed uh, the, posed the question of it, essentially, is bigger better? Do evaluating these ultra large libraries truly get you a bigger picture of chemical space or are you just kind of circling around the same sort of area? And they in fact found that chemical diversity does increase with larger chemical space searching. And they put forward the hypothesis that as screening decks expand in size, more tight binders, so binders that bind with similar affinity to known binders, and tighter binders will also be found. So to kind of put this in, in a nutshell, we are gonna look very, very broadly. We're gonna try and cover as much chemical space as we can and see if we can't get ourselves into the area that we need to be. So where we will begin is by talking a little bit about some of the enumeration tools that are within the Schrodinger suite. So there are several different options available for creating ligand libraries. We're going to focus on these top two today, but just so you know, there are more than that available. So starting with Pathfinder, which is a relatively new application within the Schrodinger platform, looked at this question of can we build up synthetically accessible libraries? So it's one thing to be able to combine different fragments all together, but to combine them together in a bit more of a thoughtful way. So looking at various reaction pathways, known chemistry, common chemistry that uh, lab labs would like to use, or even specific chemistry, you can add in your own reactions. And using that to form different libraries. So we would start off with a target compound or a hit compound. Pathfinder will analyze to see where are there specific points that we can chop down this molecule and then rebuild it, again, using common chemistry. Look for building blocks that would match the handles that would be needed to perform that chemistry. And then put everything back together using those different building blocks. Importantly, you can also add in filters, because you can imagine that these numbers, when you're adding in building blocks from hundreds of thousands or even millions, you can come up with quite large libraries. And so you can use these filters to make sure you're getting something that is a bit more manageable. You can get a much larger library, or you can get a very, very large library of ligands out of Pathfinder. Now, I do want to pause here and make it very clear that Pathfinder is not a retrosynthesis tool. It is a way of generating synthetically accessible ligands. So this does not take into account things like protecting groups and all kind of the, the finer, um, delicate side of actually doing organic synthesis, but it will get you in the ballpark. So it will output things that we do believe are more synthetically accessible than just kind of randomly mashing everything together. So the way this works kind of conceptually is again, we start from a hit or a lead compound, we figure out the different ways that it can be broken up, and then take all the different pieces, so the different kinds of building blocks that we would need, and then we can either pull from prepackaged libraries of building blocks, or you can add in your own, and you can see you can pretty quickly come up with very large libraries of ligands. So the way that this would look practically within Schrodinger software, is you would open up the reaction-based enumeration panel. The first thing you would do is pull in a compound. Um, this would only uh, work for single structures at a time. Decide where are you going to get re your reactions from, and then decide how many reaction steps you would like in your sequence. Once that's been determined, you'll get a, a number of different reaction paths that Pathfinder has determined are possible. 
Optionally, you can start adding in filters here. So if you have particular reactions you like or don't like, we can make and you know tailor that in. And then you decide where your reactant's going to come from. Once more, we have the ability to filter on the different both reactants and out, um, concomitant output products, and then click enumerate and create your library. So from here, again, you can very rapidly build up libraries of synthetically accessible small molecule ligands that you can then take on to do further evaluation with. We also have the ability, once you've maybe honed in on a particular chemotype, to do R group enumeration. So if you just want to change the decorations around there, or if you're trying to kind of hone yourself in and just do some more um, minor tweaks to your compounds, we can create different libraries based on R groups. These R groups can come from a number of different locations, so your own R groups by SMARTS or by analyzing R groups from another set of ligands. So you would choose what method for your R group enumeration you would like, choose the structures that you would like to add these R groups to, and away you go. This is also something that you can run from the command line, and you can easily transfer these libraries to colleagues. So once you have these different libraries of ligands, we need a way to evaluate them and evaluate them efficiently. So something that I mentioned earlier is the, uh, the balance of computational speed and scientific accuracy. So typically, the faster a calculation is able to run, you can imagine the less parameters it is calculating and perhaps the less scientifically rigorous it may be. Now that doesn't mean that it's not valuable, it just means there's probably different situations where you would want to use that kind of information. So again, we're starting at the beginning looking at very large ligand libraries, and so here it's valuable to us to be able to move through large numbers of ligands and cut them down to a more workable number that we would then take into higher order calculations that will take more time but be more, synthetic, or more scientifically rigorous. So once again, we are balancing scientific speed or computational speed with scientific accuracy here. So we are gonna start off with things that allow us to move quickly through these large numbers and cut them down. And so a favorite way of doing that is virtual screening. So virtual screening is a great way to take these virtual molecules that could come in, you know, libraries of millions, hundreds of millions or billions, and be able to triage through them so that we can move forward with confidence with a more workable number of ideas. So we are gonna look at this through the lens of structure-based drug design today. So there is the uh, sort of other side of the coin with ligand-based drug design, but today we're gonna look at structure-based drug design, so we are gonna assume a few things. So we will assume that the target of interest for you is known, and we're also gonna assume that you have a structure of this target, whether this structure comes from an X-ray crystal structure, perhaps a homology model, you know, there's, there's different ways that you can get this information, but this is what we will assume. And if you have this information, there's a number of different things that you can do. We're gonna focus mostly on these two down here today. So just again, to make sure that we all have a common language, uh, so structure-based drug design often begins with a crystal structure, and this is where we would take a protein crystal, fire some high-powered x-rays at it, take the resulting electron density map, map it onto the known sequence of the protein, and end up with a 3D atomic molecule. So from here, even though this is the gold standard, there are still some things that we need to do, some further steps to prepare this atomic model for computational modeling tasks. So as probably a lot of people on this call know, not all crystal structures are of the same level of quality. Now, this is where a workflow of questions is often more useful than kind of a, a simple, you know, do this, then do this, then do this, because every situation will be unique. So what we can see sometimes, ideally, is that we have a crystal structure where the electron density maps really well onto our ligand as well as the residues of our protein. We also may run into a situation where we are missing some electron density. And here's where the questions start to come in. If this is an area of your protein that's very far away from your region of interest, say binding pocket or potential allosteric pocket, perhaps this is something we're willing to tolerate. 
if this is in your binding pocket or area of interest of your protein, then this is where you would probably need to do some further refinement because not missing this information could introduce some error into your computational experiments. So again, this may or may not be a problem. It will be situation dependent, and this is where you will need to bring your critical mindset into these sorts of experiments, the same way that you would do with wet lab experiments. Once, uh, we, once we are able to determine if we have the density in place, something that is missing from all crystal structures is the fine level of detail, such as tautomeric and protonation states for various residues. Now, this is typically missing you know, almost uh, all the time, no matter how good your crystal structure is. And so this is information that's critical when designing new ligands to potentially bind to an area of interest on your protein. So this is, this is detail that will need to be added back in regardless. And we will do this with the protein preparation wizard. So the first step would be to bring in a structure from the PDB, or you could bring in uh, your own file, um, a structure that you have elsewhere. Then we would run through and fill in a lot of this missing information. So you may notice that there are boxes that are checked by default and not checked by default. So in general, with Schrodinger software, the default settings have been chosen because they've been found to work across a wide range of systems. However, once more, this is where you'll need to know about your particular system and also what you are hoping to do with the structure to be able to uh, make the best decisions here. So for instance, um, these missing side chains and loops options, they will be filled in. Prime is our structure refinement tool and it will use a bit more rigorousness, but also take longer to fill these in. Again, something like capping the termini, you may or may not want to do depending on the, what the situation um, is that you have for your protein and also what you're hoping to do with the protein. So again, we're gonna add back in things that are missing, um, potentially you know, stuff that's generally always missing, stuff that may or may not be missing depending on the nature of your structure. Next, we will then take out the things that we don't need. Very often with crystal structures, you can get uh, things that crystallize with your protein that aren't necessarily biologically relevant. So in this particular example, we have these GOL groups, which you would be able to see in the software in Maestro are just glycerols. These are not biologically relevant, so we want to take them out. You also have the ability to delete chains if that's of interest. So if you only wanna look at the monomer of a protein, you can do that here. Most importantly is deciding how you will deal with the waters in your crystal structure. So again, depending on uh, the nature of your protein, so for instance, if one or a few waters are particularly important for binding for your ligand, you may want to keep them. Um, if you are setting this up for virtual screening with Glide, which is the uh, paradigm we're, we're setting up for here, we would typically recommend that you delete all of the waters as Glide is a rigid receptor program and waters can artificially occlude a binding site if they're not taken care of appropriately. So once more, this would be a situation where you may want to delete all of them, you may want to delete none of them, or you may want to delete some of them. So again, this will depend on your situation. Finally, once you have put in the things that are missing and taken out the things that you don't need, we will go through and optimize our hydrogen bond network and then do a gentle minimization. So again, bearing in mind that we've put in a lot of things, potentially taken out of things, this will just be a gentle relaxation um, into so that all atoms are in a reasonable area of space. Now I wanna point out that in Maestro panels, all of these options, if you hover over them, you will get a tooltip telling you a bit more information and also in the bottom right of just about every panel in Schrodinger software is a question mark button or sometimes it says help and clicking on that will take you to the help information and documentation where you can find more, um, more details. So once we have fully prepared our protein structure, then we are ready to move on to our ligand structures. So an analogous step as the protein preparation wizard is lig prep. So with lig prep, this is a way to standardize and extrapolate out the chemistry of ligands regardless of the format they come in. So if you've pulled a ligand from a crystal structure or some other 3D format, this may or may not be as critical. 
However, if it's come from a 2D flat format, such as an SD file, or 1D, such as a Smiles or Smart String, being able to accurately translate that information into 3D space is critical. So this, again, we would decide where these structures are going to come from that we are going to prepare using LigPrep. We can make some determinations about the ionization. Once again, in absence of other information, the defaults are a fine place to start. And then we can decide how we're going to deal with stereo isomers. And we would click Run, and away you go. If this is on a very, very large number of ligands, you may want to change your job settings down here to distribute these across, say, an HPC cluster so that you can run these jobs in parallel. Now that we have our prepared protein structure and our prepared ligand structure, we need some way to be able to evaluate how well a ligand might want to bind to, a particular, to our protein of interest. So once again, we are going to be focusing more on the structure-based side of things today, but just to let you know, there are a number of solutions out there if you find yourself on the ligand-based side of things. We're going to start off by talking about docking. So docking if with Schrodinger software, so there are many other docking programs out there. Today, I will only be focusing on Glide, which is Schrodinger's docking application. So what I say only applies to Glide if you use something else. Um, your mileage may vary. So with Glide, we assume our receptor is rigid. So right away, I hope this is throwing up some flags in your mind that since we know that proteins do not hold still in real life, we are making a concession of scientific accuracy to get a gain in computational speed. So once again, we, we are evaluating our large swath quickly and triaging ourselves into our area of interest. So I'm going to come back to a few more implications of that in a moment. What is flexible, however, is our ligand. So we'll take a ligand, we will generate an ensemble of conformations, and then see how well they might want to fit into our receptor of, of interest. Once we are, do this, we need to have some sort of way to evaluate which of these ensemble of um, conformations and between ligands, which of these may be more or less better for our receptor of interest. And so then we do that by giving it a score. Once more, this is Glide specific. In Glide, scoring is negative. So ne the more negative, the better. So in this particular example here, negative 11 would be our quote unquote best docking score. So it's negative to reflect the change in free energy. It is also logarithmic. So even though the score output will give you several decimal places, I would really stop looking after the tens place. It's, it's a bit more holistic than this, but very, very roughly, it's logarithmic. The change in a unit roughly equals a change in an order of magnitude. So once we have our ensemble of docked poses, they are given a docking score, which helps us evaluate which ones are better for our particular system. So that's what a docking score is. What it is not is something that correlates with any sort of biological or experimental assay data. So docking scores are not designed to correlate with IC50s, KDs, things of that nature, and they are designed to give good enrichment. So this is a reflection back to what I mentioned earlier about the rigid receptor and this being a flag, uh, since we know that proteins don't hold still in real life, we are making that concession for the sake of computational speed by keeping our protein, ligand, um, protein atoms static and giving our ligand flexibility, we are able to run through, or the computer is able to run through this calculation much, much more quickly. So this is all to say docking is an enrichment tool. We are evaluating very quickly a, potentially a large number of ligands and simply trying to separate the good ideas from the bad ones so that we can carry forward with the good ideas into types of uh, calculations that are more rigorous, both in terms of their uh, science behind them and also the, the computational requirements for them. You, you don't want to, if you have a million ligands, you probably don't want to spend hours evaluating each one straight out of the gate. So we are trying to give good enrichment, be able to confidently separate good ideas from bad ones. Scoring functions come in various flavors, and within Glide, we have four different scoring functions. Two that are probably most common are our SP, or standard precision scoring function, 
and then XP, or extra precision scoring function. So right away you can see they differ a lot in their compute time. And so most people would start off with our SP scoring function, uh, particularly if they are, have limited compute resources. This is a great first pass. And if it gives you a good predictive model with good enrichment, fantastic. There's no reason that you have to move forward with um, and, and do it again with XP, but you can. So sometimes SP is sufficient for a system. Sometimes XP is able to give a bit better of enrichment here. So once we have our docked poses, we've done some sort of evaluation of them, then we can go through and do some additional filtering. And this is where you can make use of any biological information or information from the literature you might have of particular residues that you need to make contacts with or things like that. So you can go through and do some visual inspection as well as some different analysis beyond just the docking score. So to do this, we would start off by taking our prepared protein and generating a receptor grid. So the receptor grid is going to let the algorithm, the docking algorithm, know what atoms are part of the receptor and what atoms are not. So in this case here, we have a receptor that already has a ligand bound to it. So we would let the, um, let the docking algorithm know that these atoms that are part of the ligand should not be um, evaluated as part of the receptor grid during the docking process. We would then define where the binding site of interest is on our compound. So you can either do, um, like in this example here, where we already have a ligand co-crystallized with the structure, so we're very confident in the binding site. We could also input um, specific residues. So if you want to test perhaps a potential allosteric binding site or you're working with an APO protein, you can select residues here. And then that, at minimum, is all you need. And then you could give it a name and click Run. There are more information that you can add in here. And I would encourage you to take a look at some of our tutorials. But uh, for the sake of time today, I'm just going to kind of give you the minimum that is needed, and then we'll move on. But um, I do want to highlight that this constraints. I will come back to that in a few slides. So once you have your receptor grid generated, Again, generated from a prepared protein, you would take your prepared library of ligands and put these two puzzle pieces together in our ligand docking panel. So once more, defining where the receptor grid comes from, defining where the ligands come from, choosing what scoring function you would use, giving it a name, and running it. Similar to lig prep, if this is on a very large number of ligands, you may want to adjust your job settings to make use of um, external compute resources or be able to divide this job up into a number of subjobs. Once again, there are more uh, things that you can tweak here. I'm just highlighting the minimum that you need to get going. So constraints. As I mentioned before, what we are looking for with docking is enrichment. We want to be able to recover our known binders as quickly as possible during a virtual screen. So let's say we had 10 known binders that we mixed with 90 decoys or dud ligands, so ligands that we don't know anything about, and then we dock them against our receptor. If we had no enrichment, those 10 binders, known binders, would be randomly distributed in the docking output, so their docking scores would be all over the place. They would essentially be meaningless. So if we had to travel from our lowest or best docking scores down to our highest or worst docking scores, we would have to travel pretty far through our library to recover all of our 10 known binders. So that would be bad enrichment. And if you were to plot that here, where we would have you know, essentially how far you had to go through your library to recover your specific amount of known actives, if that line sort of just travels along the midpoint here, that's random distribution, and we can say that our virtual screen is not providing any sort of enrichment where we recover our known actives earlier. So these are two results from two real virtual screens, one without constraints built into the receptor and one with constraints built in. So constraints allow you to specify that a particular uh, event must be satisfied. So in this case, a hydrogen bond 
was specified that it must be made with a certain residue in the uh, protein. So we can see that by defining that, and so only ligands that were able to make that particular hydrogen bond would be considered a result to the docking uh, algorithm. And with that hydrogen bond increase, you can see that we got this nice boost in enrichment where we were able to cover a much greater number of actives much more quickly. So here, at about um, t traveling about 25% through our library, we were able to recover 70% of our known actives, as opposed to here, where it takes about traveling through about 70% uh, of the library to recover 70% of our known actives. So hopefully that just adds a little bit more color around what I mean by enrichment. We want to recover our actives as quickly as possible when we're doing a virtual screen. This allows us to move forward with more confidence when screening unknowns. So to put this to some what of a schematic here, this is what I would say is an idealized workflow for virtual screening with Glide. So we would obtain a compound library, either a commercially available one or perhaps one that we generated using reaction-based enumeration or R group enumeration. Filtering is always faster than screening. So if you know that a particular ligand is not going to be a, a good drug candidate before it ever sees a protein receptor, filter it out, prepare the library. Similarly, we will prepare our protein, generate grids, test grids. So testing grids would be akin to something like this here, where we're trying to increase the enrichment that we see by mixing known binders in with duds or decoys. Once we're happy with that, then we bring those two puzzle pieces together in the virtual screen, and then we have a number of post-processing steps that we can do. So some things to consider, because all virtual screening campaigns will vary with their needs and with the targets that you're working with. So we would say, again, bear in mind computational speed and scientific accuracy, so this will depend on the computational resources you have available to you, as well as the size of the ligand libraries you're interested in evaluating. Some common things that we do on our side when running virtual screening campaigns is run everything with Glide SP, and then do a few more steps, so retaining the best pose, and then using um, the command line if working with very, very large libraries. So this is, if this is of interest to you, I would encourage you to reach out to help at Schrodinger.com and we have a very talented team of scientific and technical support uh, folks who would be happy to help you out with your particular situation. If you do have limited compute resources, a panel to be aware of is the virtual screening workflow. This will allow you to tie many different kinds of docking jobs together at once. So your input would be just your unprepared ligand files. Immediately you can filter and prepare your ligands in one shot. So these are somewhat stripped down versions of the lig prep panel that we saw before. You can input one or multiple receptors. So here's where you can start to do creative things like say screening for off targets. So if you have isoform one, two, and three of your particular target of interest and you only want to uh, bind to isoform one, you could do something like generate receptors for isoforms one, two, and three dock against all three receptors and try and identify compounds that bind well to isoform 1 and poorly to isoforms 2 and 3. HTVS is another one of our uh, scoring functions. This is the cheapest in terms of computational resources. This can do somewhere between one and a couple ligands per second. Again, SP is somewhere between 5 to 20 seconds per ligand, depending on the nature of your ligand. XP will take a couple minutes, usually three to five per ligand. And what you can do here is decide how many will get carried through to each step, either a hard cutoff of a number of ligands or a certain percentage, the top 10% or 20% or, or something, and carry them into next. So again, this is a way that you can string together many docking um, jobs at once. So now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about it a little bit more from a pharmacophore-based approach. So with pharmacophore screening, a lot of times that gets thought of as something that is a, a ligand-based drug design technique, and it is. There are also ways that it can be applied in a structure-based situation and augment results that come out of a virtual screen with Glide. So with a pharmacophore screen, we would kind of flip the paradigm around, and now we're gonna look at the ligand and try and identify what are the particular 
features in space that make a certain ligand a good binder, we will pull out those features in space and screen against that to, to use that to triage through our large ligand library. For pharmacophore screening with Schrodinger software, we will use an application called Phase. And again, I'm a, there are many other different software packages out there for pharmacophore screening, so everything I say is, is only applicable to Phase within the Schrodinger software. But we have different kinds of features that can be represented in space that we can put together. So we can have, say, a known binder that we pull out these features in space. We would have them available. We would screen different ligands to see how well they would match those features in space and then use that information to try and identify potential hits that, we can, be, that can be further developed. An interesting thing about phase is that we can bias particular features. So if, you know, again, if you know that one particular hydrogen bond is very important for binding in your system, you can bias that. We can also add in excluded volumes, so regions where your ligand cannot be. So again, this is another way that I would uh, virtual screen in consensus, so using both docking and pharmacophore-based approaches. We can generate pharmacophores from many different sources here, so multiple ligands, a single binder, the re uh, APO receptor, and the APO ligand comp or sorry, and the receptor ligand complex. So by looking at an APO receptor, this actually performs a fragment-based virtual screen on the back end and uses those fragments to pull out where particular pharmacophoric features in space may be. Once you have this model, you can screen it against different ligands. The results will look something like this, where you can see what are the different features. So I know this lettering is very small, but the A stands for acceptor, D donor, things like that, so you can get a quick sense of what features are in space, how well a particular ligand matches those features in space, and use that information again to triage through your large ligand library. A thing to bear in mind is kind of the greater the dimensionality, so are we looking at something in 1D, 2D, or 3D? the longer it takes to screen, and so 3D-based approaches are the most expensive. Again, docking somewhere between 5 and 20 seconds, you know, maybe an average of 10. If you were to screen 500 million compounds, which is a number of compounds that is very easily accessible using reaction-based virtual screening, it would take you far too long if you had a single uh, CPU or single GPU, you know, processing unit that you could use. Pharmacophore screening is much faster, but still too long. And here's where we can bring in shape screening. So shape screening on a CPU, even faster. Shape screening on a GPU, you have the ability to screen 500 million ligands at roughly overnight. And so shape screening will take uh, a look at the shapes, the 3D shapes of known binders and try and use that information to pull out if other ligands are likely to be able to be a binder as well. So for this, we would say, say A, molecule A is our known binder, and we are interested in evaluating molecule B. So the abstraction of the 3D shape in space would be made for both these molecules. The sum of the overlap would then uh, be compared to the full amount of, of volume of these two ligands, and that would give us a sense of how well these two would, would relate to each other. So obviously the, the higher the shape score, so where we have uh, you know, a high amount of overlap as compared to the total amount of volume would be good. We can also add in a little bit of pharmacophoric type features, so color to these ligands where it would look at you know, our, where our different parts of these molecules, do they match different kinds of pharmacophoric features? And so to do this on a GPU is a great way, particularly starting with those very, very large ligand libraries, to try and cut that down to something a bit more manageable for moving into things like uh, virtual screening with Glide or Phase. So using, these um, using the uh, create shape data file, we can take our ligands of interest, so these would be our, our known binders, we would create the shapes from these ligands. You have the ability to generate the conformers as part of this panel, decide if we're gonna add in that pharmacophoric information or not, run that, 
Once you have that shape data file, you would then decide again, oh, I'm sorry, these are the ligands that we're interested in screening. So I apologize. So these are the ligands we are interested in screening. Once we have that uh, shape data file of our ligands that we're interested in screening created, we would then take our shape query from our known binders. So this would typically be a much smaller number. So anywhere uh, between one and 10, we would say is probably a good place to start with. So known binders, where our shapes that we're gonna compare to come from. Decide are we gonna run this screen on a CPU or GPU. Screen structures in a file. So again, that would be structures from this shape data file for a GPU earlier. Or if you're running on a CPU, you could take them directly from say a lig prep file or something like that, and then run our shape screen. So to kind of put all of this in a, a small bucket, because I, I'm aware of time, and I wanna point out a few additional resources. Virtual screening tools are great for triaging yourself through a very large number of ligands that you're interested in evaluating. I would suggest using these tools in conjunction with each other as opposed to kind of a linear workflow. You can use them again to cut down this large number into something that's more workable that you can then feed into virtual screening methods that take a lot more time. So these, you know, methods such as MMGBSA, induced fit docking, or free energy perturbation with FEP plus that again will take a lot longer but give you much more scientific, scientifically rigorous results that do compare with experimental information do give uh, rank ordered output in terms of being able to determine definitively that one ligand is better than another and by roughly how much. So to throw out my last warnings, virtual screening with a rigid receptor does add in some complications as we know that proteins are constantly moving around. Bear in mind that virtual screening looks at one particular snapshot of your protein and so it's always worth pausing and making sure you're looking at the snapshot that is most meaningful for you. So if we have a situation like this one here, where our ligand finds a binding site that's relatively stable across time in this molecular dynamic simulation, great. But if our binding site of interest is more down here where we're seeing some very wild motions in the shape of the receptor, then these are some things that we may need to take into account. So to sum that up, start off with good structure quality. So make sure that you are looking at something that has a well-resolved and fine detail that you need. So run it through the protein preparation wizard. Make sure that we are adding back in the information that's missing, taking out what we don't need. Proteins are flexible. Make sure you're looking at the correct state of your protein to begin with in terms of what you are hoping, you know, the research question you're hoping to ask. And finally, make sure you know what a particular calculation can tell you and what it cannot. Virtual screening is great at hit finding. It will not give you rank ordering information. It will give you the ability to triage quickly through a large amount of ligands and then move forward with a smaller amount of ligands that you can spend more time on. So here I have another tool, the Protein Reliability Report. This is a great thing to use, particularly if you find yourself in the enviable situation of having many possible proteins to start with. This will give you a quick qualitative look at a number of different characteristics of protein structure quality and let you know if things generally look good or if you have some liabilities that you should address before moving forward. Uh, very quickly, all of this is accessible through the Maestro interface. I will, try and, um, I will try and make a PDF of these slides available afterwards in addition to this video, um, presentation is being recorded. So you can take this away and refer back to it later on. A few tips. When you start with Maestro, change your working directory. This is where Maestro will look first for any files you read in and importantly, save any files that you generate. Save all your work as a project then all your work will be automatically saved. Every step you take, every change that you make within a saved project is automatically saved without having to click the save button somewhere. Finally, check your mouse actions, particularly if you often find yourself using a mouse at your desk and then taking your laptop without a mouse to a meeting. 
So again, I will make sure these slides are distributed. These are just a few things to help you uh, get going with Maestro. In Maestro, if you get stuck, hover over it or right click on it. Just about everything is right clickable and that's how you interact or find more options for interacting with a particular uh, part of your structure or object in Maestro. As I mentioned earlier, just about everything in the panels, if you hover over them, you'll get a tooltip of more information. Same with the buttons in the Maestro interface. If you hover over them, you can find out more about what those buttons do. In the task tool in the top right, you can search for particular items. So if you don't know what something is called, or if you just are interested to see what's in there, you can search for terms. So for instance, if you weren't familiar with the software to know that Glide is our docking algorithm, you could search for something like docking or virtual screening, and it would take you to the right spot. And then again, that question mark or help button in the bottom right of all the panels will take you to the documentation for that panel. If you get really stuck, you can go to your job monitor and create a post-mortem file. You have the ability to hide any structures or directory names that contain proprietary information. This will create a zip file that you can send directly to our scientific and technical support team to allow them to get to the root of the issue a lot more, um, with a lot more information than just a screenshot or a log file alone. Our knowledge base is like an FAQ. It's regularly updated, a great source of information. Also, you're always welcome to email help at schrodinger.com. So this is a global team. Somebody is always up, and they do aim to give you a very speedy response. I do want to point out that within the software, the help menu is actually helpful. And so going to help and the help menu, you can. we have about 55 tutorials that we include. We have our user manuals. We have some quick references. And again, this is also searchable, so you can look for particular key items that you want to find in here. We also have a lot of information available online, so schrodinger.com slash training. So you can uh, get to that directly, or you can go to our support, schrodinger.com, click on support, and go to our training resources. So we have a number of short videos, again, um, somewhere around 55 tutorials. We have pre-recorded and upcoming webinars that you can look through. We are also offering our first online molecular modeling course. I also think it's handy to see how other people have used the software successfully enough to get a publication. So we regularly update our publications page. So if you're interested in uh, doing a virtual screening campaign, it might be worthwhile to see, again, how other people have used this uh, successfully enough to get a publication. And again, I'll, I will try and distribute these slides, but just pointing out a few explicit links for videos of some of the things that we covered today. And then just highlighting, again, these helpful uh, sources of information that are available online. So a little bit more about our online course. So we are offering different sessions of this course. So this includes access to a web-based version of Maestro that contains all the project files you need, as well as live design. We estimated that it takes about 20 hours to complete in about a four-week period, and uh, student participants who pass the course are given a certificate and a LinkedIn badge. Again, I will distribute these slides, but you can look at our course outline online. This teaches both the use of Maestro and Live Design, as well as concepts around drug design. So this includes a case study at the end, where you will bring all those different um, lessons that you've learned together to actually design and evaluate ligands on a drug target. So this is hosted on a online learning platform where we have been able to allow people to jump back and forth um, to very specific spots in a professionally recorded presentation. They're all annotated and we've created this with an active learning approach. So it isn't just kind of death by PowerPoint. These are interactive videos and you do have quizzes, assignments, and again, a case study to complete to make sure that um, you are able to integrate these concepts into a live drug discovery project. So thank you very much for joining me. That was a, a whirlwind tour of multiple different applications within Schrodinger software for designing large libraries of ligands and being able to quickly evaluate them using a number of different virtual screening techniques. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much. That's a truly impressive amount of functionality. It's a, it's a very, very impressive, cool software tool. Uh, I do have a few questions here. And if you, anyone else has any questions, 
Uh, you can send them to me by chat, or um, I could uh, I could also unmute you if you'd like to ask yourself. Just send me a message. Um, one question that I had was, could uh, could you talk a little bit about grid optimization? So when you're in the sort of receptor prep stage and you're trying to you're making your grid, um, uh, and there's box sizes that you can vary. There's a, mm -hmm. uh, other other handles and um, uh, what sort of metrics are you looking for for you know? success in optimizing your your receptor grid size yeah that that is a very important question so for uh for receptor grid generation and again this is all schrodinger software specific so different uh other uh, software out there may may do this differently so for receptor grid generation and schrodinger software you you can think about it as a, a grid like multiple different files that are being used and so each of the atoms in your receptor is put in a grid and you can think of it as finer and finer mesh and so this part this gives us a great uh, increase in speed so this ligand will would have a first pass through kind of the the widest mesh so the widest grid points apart if it falls through quote unquote if it doesn't clash with any of these grid points it would then go through the next finer mesh where the grid points of the atoms in the receptor are a little bit closer together, closer and closer, until we find a pose that doesn't clash with any of this finer, of the, you know, even the most fine mesh of our receptor grid. If a pose cannot be found that doesn't clash, it will be thrown out, so it's not gonna return results that are, are unreasonable. In terms of deciding the grid box size, so this, it may be a little difficult to see here, but this kind of pink purple box is the outer bound box. And then there's also an inner bound box, which we don't see here. So the outer bound box here, uh, the ligand atoms must fall within this box to be considered a solution to the docking algorithm. So this allows the, the algorithm to kind of ignore atoms that are outside of this. So this is part of a, the speed. You can make this box anywhere uh, up to a maximum of 40 by 40 by 40 angstroms. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend that, particularly if this is to try and do some sort of global docking where you evaluate the, the entire structure of the protein. So if for only, it will greatly blow out your calculation time. Instead, I would say use a tool within Schrodinger software called Sitemap to try and identify putative binding sites you can dump that information directly into your receptor grid generation and, and go from there. So the size of your box, you can tweak yourself. Um, I think that, so if you go to the, the next page to the site settings and click on advanced settings down here, you can make that box larger or smaller if you wanted. Uh, rotatable groups and constraints is something I didn't really talk about. Constraints briefly, rotatable groups allows you to give OH and SH groups the freedom of, of rotation there. So it's a little tweak to get you around the rigid receptor paradigm. So again, this may or may not be of interest to you. It may greatly impact your results. We would say um, if you have a lot of rotatable groups, particularly in your binding site, this could be of interest. In general, we say no more than six. Again, if only because it will greatly blow out your calculation time. So evaluating these receptors uh, would be a large part in that uh, looking at that retrospective analysis, like how well can you recover known actives when they're mixed in with unknowns, so duds or decoys. So this would be, I think, a, the importance of this step is not to be underestimated. Um, you want to be able, when you're doing prospective screens, to have confidence that stuff that's at the top of your results, so the best docking scores, uh, is truly meaningful. So uh, sort of related question here, and, and this is for the, um, so the docking scores are, you know, they have these scoring functions, and then, you know, they, some of them are super simple, they just count the number of hydrogen bonds, or some of them are very, very complex. The the glide scores themselves, like, do they account for, like, binding physics, or, you know, rotable bond penalties, hydrophobic uh, context, that sort of thing, and then the, um, uh, or is it purely just a sort of algorithmic, like good ligands tend to have these things, you know, or sort of a mix? Uh, more towards the first. So the, the actual equation that's being used, you can find in both the Glide user manual, as well as um, I think it's our J Med Chem paper from 2005. 
uh, talking about glide scoring functions. So it would it does take into account things like electrostatics, van der Waals, um, as well as sterics and kind of your more classical things. And uh, on the subject of rigid receptors, I was if you had a receptor ensemble, would the best case there be to like break out your ensemble and then run independent screens to sort of figure out which one is giving you the best um, enrichment? Or can you work with an ensemble directly? I would recommend uh, if you have an ensemble available to you, that's a really good starting point. So if you have multiple crystal structures of your protein in, in the correct conformational state, I think that's always worthwhile putting putting into things. So whether they're all ensembles of kind of your protein of interest or ensembles in terms of protein of interest and off targets, you could um, input them at once in your virtual screening workflow here with multiple receptors. We also have another panel called cross docking or X, like the letter X docking to allow you or to do that as well. Great. Well, with that, uh, it's one o'clock, so we can uh, wrap it up. Jennifer, thank you very much. This was a great introduction, and uh, uh, I wish I had some crystal structures to dock Wiggins into. Uh, ah, we'll try <laughs> phase and pharmacophore screening. Oh, yeah. Let's see what you great. can get. So, well, great. no, thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you for allowing me the time to speak, and thank you to everyone who joined. And great. again, feel free to reach out, help at Schrodinger.com. Very happy to answer any additional questions. Thank great. you. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for joining. Take care.